Welcome to Door County Library's program in honor of Veterans Day 2021. To all veterans, thank you for your service. Today, we're going to welcome Door County native Jerry Grassel to the library to talk about his experience in the United States Army Security Agency in the late 1950s during the Cold War. Jerry has written a book of stories of his time in the service available in the library and other places um, during uh, the Cold War in Germany. And he's also interested in hearing maybe at the end of the program, uh, experiences of other veterans and uh, where they served. Without further ado, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Jerry. And then Jerry, let's share your um, program. Thank you two assistants that are going to try and make me look good because this is my first attempt at this. Um, I want to welcome you. I want to salute you. I want to give you greetings and I want to review and preview time that I spent in the service and that millions of other American men and women have spent in the service. And I think it's fitting that we stop and pay due attention to this and observance of it. And that is why this comes very close to coinciding with tomorrow Veterans Day. So I'm going to go through some of the circumstances, instances, experiences that I, along with tens of thousands of other servicemen encountered and I hope it inspires some pride in those of you watching. I hope it tickles some of your remembrance. And we will get to the point where we will welcome comments and some things that you may want to add and some things that you may want to challenge. Um, as you look at the page now, there is a book that I published four years ago. And um, I find people enjoying it who were not in the service and maybe only grandparents were alive. The part of the book that seems to resonate with readers is it says, revealing, amusing, and educational. Um, the amusing part seems to stick out more than what I thought it did at the time of writing. The book was inspired my colleagues that I served time in the service. Um, I guess it starts after we were out 50 years. We had a reunion in Branson. There was about, were about 18 of us, some with spouses at Branson. And that uh, meeting was from Germany to Branson 50 years. Uh, that was the basis for stories that were thrown around and some of the other people told me I should write a book. We had a very rough book at that time, mostly pictures, but it evolved over time. Uh, looking at the page now, the middle symbol is the symbol that the Army Security Agency was awarded to use as their crescent or their patch. Um, most of People that I worked with were in the Army Security Agency that I worked with daily. However, we also worked with and did exercises with infantry, armored, artillery, Corps of Engineering. Much of our work was evolved around electronic spying on the East Germans and Russian. Thus, the symbol was the lightning bolts and uh, it is a claw. It's supposed to be the white bald eagle. Some people jokingly call it the chicken plucker. So take your choice. On, on the right hand side is a picture of my roommate, the tall man. It's John Frame from Tarpon Springs, Tarpon or Tarpoon, however you want to pronounce it, from Florida. And I have the shorter guy to his right, left on your screen. We received our new dress green uniforms. I think it was spring of 58. It was, it was late winter, spring. Uh, 
Some areas of the military had those dress greens in the army six to 18 months before us. Up to that time, our uniform was the Second World War Ike jacket called Olive Drab in color. Um, I think we'll go to the next screen at this point. Um, if you have any questions on this, please keep them and we'll try and discuss them or comments either way. The next page will go a little faster. The first to the left is, um, as it says, unclassified. It, it's addressed to um, Secretary, I, I don't remember reading this one. It lists the Army Security Agency, the jurisdiction under which, which it was formed, a lot of technical work and letters in it. Um, I did not have this when I wrote the book. I think what it is, is authorization to form the Army Security Agency, which was kind of a subset of the NSA and of the Signal Corps. The second uh, piece of paper is travel orders that were printed up at battalion level if you were in the Army. I'm not sure what level, Air Force or Marines, um, but those were what you would call orders in the second, third line says travel orders. It's indicative of what the people two levels above you did when they wanted you to go and work somewhere else in Europe. Uh, briefly, this one gives a destination of Portiers, France. Uh, we were to go 26 days in service, American servicemen in France at different posts and ba different bases, work with them, try and clarify questions they had about communications and acutely train them to be sharper in their communications because we were well aware that spies, East Germans and Russians were listening electronically to our communications, masses of troops and things of that nature. Uh, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, item four says top secret and crypto information. I think item two says to carry ammunition and weapons. And we did carry at that time M1s, M14s. And sometimes when we were working actually on our job in a radio hut, we did have our weapons loaded. As um, many of you may be aware, it was Cold War period of time and uh, we didn't want it to get hot. So it was, it was very crucial. Uh, some of you are well aware that shortly before this, the Russians had launched a satellite that circled the earth and they were ahead of the Western countries and powers in that regard. Okay, I went one too far. This is, um, when we were pictures when we were stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia, which was at Sigma Corps base. It could have been at Fort Evans or outside Washington, DC near Arlington Hall or at the language school in Van Nuys, California. Um, we put the note on there. For those of you that are older, you can recognize the barracks that we were in. And for those that were younger, that's, uh, basically our living quarters. Some of those buildings are probably still standing. We lived up and down probably 24 to 36 bunks on each level, double bunk up and down, very hot. We were uh, there from late February to August 14th or 15th. There's a picture taken of me. I don't remember being that happy on the left but I, apparently I was. The picture on the right shows several of us, the two on the left in the back, two on the right in the back, did not get a leave or a pass for the weekend. Uh, four of us did. If I remember correctly, about half of us got off every weekend from Friday night to Monday morning. Um, the man on the lower right with his hand on the knee was my Buddy from Sturgeon Bay, we entered under the buddy system. 
and it's only guaranteed to keep people together through advanced training at the most. But we were lucky enough to stay together for the entire two years and 22 years, seven months and 22 days. The man kneeling on the uh, to his right was Albert Beaver, I believe from Oklahoma. I'm the shorter guy in the back row with the light shirt on. And the guy next to me, I think is Sims. He was a Southern, Southern boy. Um, for some reason, the group I was in that was selected for this type of electronic training consisted of a great number of tall people. There were, I think, 18 in a group, and I believe 13 of them were six feet or taller, and several of them, about six two or six three, uh, was not supposed to be on size, but on aptitude test, but that's the way it worked out. All right, the next picture shows uh, the group I was with uh, the day or the day after we graduated. Uh, I think all of us were newly enlisted, except the man on the left on the picture with the shiny uh, first class hat. He has a rank on his arm of an E4 or an E5. Um, he was sent by the powers that be to go through the code school. He probably got a promotion by completing that school, which was generally 23 weeks, weeks in length. Um, it was hot, started in March, we got through middle of August. So I'll give you a couple seconds if you want to, to read the names and uh, I guess I'm trying to find where I am in the back row. Um, I believe I'm the, oh no, I'm the fourth one from the left standing. So second row standing, still a corn frame climber. Yes, I'm the fourth one. So you, at that time, I didn't shrink yet. I was five foot 10. So you can easily see how tall the other people were, especially the two to my right and a couple on the other far end. Some of those kneeling were, were also six one or six two. So we look pretty happy. Upon graduation, we automatically made E3 by the uh, private stripe on her shoulder. The next picture shows the method of travel overseas, whether a soldier, Marine, whatever branch you may have been in, generally in the 50s got sent by ship. The picture to the upper right is the Buckner, typical cruise ship typical ship that was used to send troops overseas, uh, generally to Europe at that time. I believe it held six to 650 uh, troops in addition to the crew that manned the ship. It was not luxurious as if you uh, were traveling on a passenger ship. Uh, the picture on the left probably captured your attention already. Uh, that was typical living quarters on a troop ship. The bunks were three to six high. This says four. I, I do believe if you were only three high. And the bottom picture, I believe, is docked in Bremerhaven, Germany. Some ships stopped at Southampton or Southampton, however you want to pronounce them, British name in, in uh, Britain. About half the ship stopped there and left um, troops off. Our officers or equipment stayed one night and then took about a day, maybe 14 hours of travel to go up to the northern part of Germany and dock at Bremerhaven. And we were happy to be on soil. The conditions on the ship um, were not first class, second class, or third class. I believe in the picture there's something amusing. I think they're playing cards or dice we found out that both were illegal by military standards, but it didn't seem to bother them. Generally, people looked the other way if there weren't any fights involved. We found out that when troops played dice, if they threw them on the steel bulkheads or metal bottom of the ship, due to the 
um, water and the structure of the ships, the clinking and clunking paths for hundreds of feet up and down the ship. And the powers to be knew that the troops were playing dice. So they generally put a couple blankets down to try and get around uh, someone interfering in their illegal dice game. The next series of pictures shows Germany at the time as it states above 1945, the different colors are indicative of the different countries and powers that occupy them. The entire uh, blue, light green, pink or orange, and I guess brown or beige were the different areas of Germany. I think we found out the lower picture between the two larger picture this West Germany, and then Holland or the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France. Um, the Russians had a larger area to occupy to the right of Russia was Poland. You can see Berlin on the picture. Uh, the symbol above was put there by one of the people aiding me, almost matches the color that's a hammer and sickle. The symbol of the United Socialist Republic at that time. The British occupied the larger section. Um, Americans, the, the beige section, and the French, the blue section. Uh, one item that isn't highly talked about, the British and the French fought each other in several wars over decades and centuries. And if you notice on the picture, the French area it's closer to France, which makes sense. And the British area is further north. Even at that time, although they were on the winning side, Allied powers in the Second World War, they more or less kept the French and the British somewhat separated and the Americans between. The city of Frankfurt, which was a bustling city already in the 50s, recovering with an infusion of a lot of Western money, quite modern, 12 to 15 years after the war ended, was a show place. Um, assistant has pointed out Frankfurt, approximate location. Munich also, which is not on there, was much further south, another large city. And the other large city of Hamburg is up on the water, the inlets close to Bremerhaven. When we got off the ship, we were put on trains we got off on the north in the area south of the uh, British Commonwealth flag. We got on troop, troop cars, kind of shoved in. We kept going south throughout Germany. About half of the troops got off at the city of Frankfurt and were dispersed to different bases throughout Germany at that time. I and about a fourth of the men on the pictures, five or six others, were sent back north. Uh, by a train to the city of Castle, and we were stationed at the base called Rothwesten, shown on the map. As you can see, very, very close to the border with Eastern Germany or Russian occupied Germany. It was quite nervous at the time. Sputnik had just gone up in the air a few years sooner. Parts of the Iron Curtain were being built up and down the area of Germany and also along Czechoslovakia and Austria. Uh, Berlin, as indicated, shows uh, on the pink map, and you had to go through one way only to there or by airplane. And Berlin is further detailed, aptly detailed to the upper right. And that was also divided into four sections. Again, the Soviet Union occupying East Berlin, uh, for those of you that don't know, the political game at the time between the, pol the politicians was to allow the Soviets to capture the bunker where Hitler was uh, that disappointed many Western generals and field captains because they had fought all the way from the landing in France to the middle of Berlin and took many, many casualties and deaths uh, but the politics of the situation at the time overruled the military on the field. 
So the border was uh, driven up and down through the city of Berlin. I was never fortunate enough to travel there. But again, you can see it was divided into the French, British, and American sectors. Um, some of you have probably heard of the Berlin airlift. Uh, there was a period of time in which the Soviets blocked the one road that came from West Berlin to Berlin. And at that time, our president had enough backbone to say, okay, if we can't come a road, we're gonna fly planes. And for several months, I forget the period of time, many supplies and food was brought into Berlin by air. Uh, I think Khrushchev at the time was the leader of Russia, I, I don't recall for sure. Let's look at the bottom picture. That's also Western Germany without the divisions in it. The top picture, top one, I believe it's Hamburg. Is that Bern? Bonn, which was the capital of West Germany at the time. They made it the capital, the previous capital had been Berlin, but since it was surrounded by the Russians, the Western powers, Allied powers, and the German people put this capital in Bonn, and that lasted for maybe 20 some years. Down on the bottom, uh, can you help me out with that one? Um, Munich. All right, that was Munich, another large city, Hamburg, Munich, and uh, Frankfurt were the larger cities. They were basically showcases. Much Western money was poured in. The re recovery was very fast. Uh, for many years, the East Germans were kept ignorant of it, but over a period of time, like four decades, the uh, capitalism rapidly outpaced communism. And eventually that brought about the change of opening up the city. And um, the two, the two, uh, the three areas plus East Druin becoming unified. I think that was about 1990 between, uh, it was Reagan and Gorbachev, if I remember correctly. Okay, the base that we just, the base, it, or go back, the left says Castle Roth Western. Roth Western is shown on this slide. It was not a large base. It had been a base of Hitler's that he used for reconnaissance flights of propeller driven planes to fly over Poland, the Netherlands, and other countries that were going to be occupied or already had been occupied. The blank area at the top was the uh, field where the planes landed. It was a dirt runway with metal grits. It was full of shepherds with um, hundreds of sheep. And to disguise the airport, they left the shepherds and the sheep graze on that open area. So it disguised the runway. Shepherds had about the smartest dogs in the world. Many people will agree with that. When the German planes would come to land, they simply gave the dogs the command to uh, shove the sheep sideways, the German planes land, and they went into the buildings. Uh, some of the buildings had bunkers underground. As you can see from the picture, this was taken recently. The original Rothwestern base was not discovered until sometime in 1945 from tens of thousands of feet up by a high, high capacity camera from a plane they call the Spitfire. That, the building in the upper left was a theater I believe that was built after the war. Uh, Americans immediately occupied it, kept some German soldiers prisons there. Then the Air Force took over in about 47, 48. The American army came several years later. To the right in the picture, you see the front of some buildings, uh, which is white in color. With those are red tiled roofs, of course, Red tiles are all over European cities. The arrow now indicates the building that I was stationed in. It was the 184th Army Security Agency building. It was a double building. You see two white 
fronts to the left on the buildings. We'll show another just to the left of the second front, a small building built on built on the front of the second one from the left, right below the arrow. That was the good old below the arrow. Yeah, that was the mess hall that served about eight buildings. So it was attached to the building I was stationed in. Uh, it was a double-sized building, which served its purpose very well. So they just made that company the largest company. This is the same building on the left that I tried to indicate and I'll go back to the last slide. If you see the two buildings that the arrow points to, the building farthest up on this frame is to the left on this picture. Oh, wrong way. There we go. So the building to the left that shows half, that was the front of one. The building to the right is the other one. The connector in the middle didn't show much in the picture. Those are indicative of the cars at the time. Um, the building in the middle on the bottom is where the officers' office were. Uh, we had a captain who got promoted to a major at the time because of the oversize of our troops in the building. The small sets of windows on the second floor served what was called a day room. That's where soldiers would go uh, to listen to radio, uh, write letters, play card games. The building was maybe 50 feet long by 30 feet wide. It also served other purposes where we got paid. The top windows above it were only used for storage at that time. The building on the right has three levels of, um, of bed bedrooms, basically every window you see, except the three on the bottom left were, were rooms where there'd be two or three men in uh, sparse, a foot locker, a wall locker, two beds. You can see the older cars, uh, American Willys, Jeep facing outward. The vehicles are mostly German vehicles that were, I would say two to six years old. And I believe the vehicle to the left was one of them, what Hitler developed called the People's Car or Volkswagen. The upper right, uh, I'm to the left, my friend that had a buddy system with for the tour the whole duration. Um, this is in Austin Healy in a small print. We could not afford something like that. So we're posing next to the Austin Healy we did not own. But we printed that. Um, I have a very long top coat on, which indicates to me, I don't remember, indicates to me I was probably going to go downtown in the winter. Germans at that time wore long top coats. It's maybe because if you had a long top coat, you could serve more people than a short top coat. Um, we did not get a lot of snow there where we were, generally four to five inches. However, when we went on maneuvers, the elevation went up and we did get a lot of snow. The bottom picture was hard to show on this previous slide. It would be in the upper right-hand corner. I'm not sure if I'm correct in saying it's, it's one of the two in the upper right-hand corner. If I said left-hand, it's upper right-hand. This is the front of that building more recently in 1948. The Allied powers cooperated with the um, emerging German government. And this was a building called House Posen, uh, Haas Posen, or Posen Haas, Haas for House, Posen, a man's last name. This is where they rekindled or redeveloped the German mark. They called it the Deutschmark. Before that, it was called the Reichmark or however you want to pronounce R-E-I-C-H, which is also synonymous with a period of time. But Mark was the basic unit of their currency until the Euro was introduced. At that time, um, soldiers were using a currency called script. I'm not sure we have 
I don't think we have a picture of script on here. It was paper money that uh, Allied soldiers used rather than American dollar. The American dollar was introduced throughout much of Europe, I believe in May of 1950, 58, right? Locally, um, the war was over for 12 to 15 years. Um, some places, the downtown areas were still decimated, but we had um, quite a bit of reconstruction in the city of Castle. Soldiers free bus ran there every couple of hours, more frequently on the weekend. It has a UNESCO site, and that site is shown on the left called Hercules Mount Monument. Up on the very top, there's a statue of Hercules. Uh, somebody gave that statue and the monument, I believe in the 1800s as a tribute to some leader in Germany. Uh, Wilhelm Schul is the park below the statue. It shows water running down. It's a very prominent, well-known landmark. I understand recently that the water flows two times a week, I think Wednesdays and Sundays, this can be checked out by tourist information. And I know at some times they actually put food color in, made a very, very beautiful, beautiful scene. Um, it's, I think the top monument is about 800 feet above the city. So it takes a winding road to get up to the top, just at the bottom of the monument. Now, thinking back several uh, scenes, I mentioned that the train from Bremerhaven would take troops south to, to uh, Frankfurt. They usually didn't stop along the way unless it was to leave merchandise off. When you got to Frankfurt, you were booted out of the machine, army buses took you to a processing center. And this building, second picture from the left, is a front entrance. At that time, I think it's still the front entrance. Gutleit Kasern, which Kasern is their word for barracks or buildings or billets. Gutleit, I believe, goes back to the 1800s, as it says, Frankfurt Processing Center. Frankfurt maybe should have a U instead of an O. I'm not sure. You're right. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, that's where the American troops. I, I should go back and correct that. The F U R T, sometimes they put an O, sometimes they put a U, but it's pronounced the same to us. All right, that was a processing center for American armed forces, mostly Army, but Air Force, the few Marines did go through there. It's a place. The long walls are masonry all the way around. I remember it being in the middle, very small arches because when they built it, they didn't have wide machines or wide mechanized or, or wheeled vehicles to go through. So I think a, a regular truck could go through, but not much beyond it. We were fortunate that in our city, the uh, Marshall Plan poured a lot of money in. And that money developed into improvements that are showing showing up in the upper right hand picture, labeled Steppenstrasse. It took me a while to get used to the term Steppen. It translates into street. I believe it translates into street of steps or walkways. And you can see no no vehicles. It was a pride. Uh, there was by far the first city that was reconstructed in that city. It's a show place of what can be done with Western capitalistic money. Several other cities in Western Germany also had show places bragging about the uh, virtues of capitalism versus what one would see if they went to East Berlin or any of the other larger cities that were in Eastern Germany under Russian control, still lying in ruins. That was a shopping area. Somewhere on that street, about two levels up, there was a building that had in the window, America House, where they would talk about Americans. I went in, asked, and they said, we're trying, attempting to build relationships between Germany 
and the Western powers as to where it was before we had war. Um, on the walls inside, they had pictures of Niagara Falls, a buffalo hunt, and a few other iconic scenes from the United States. I think some other walls had Big Ben and some other Western pictures that were very iconic throughout the walls. At the time I was there, it was run by German, German citizens. Going down the pictures, it says Castle Hop the Bahnhof. Hop the Bahnhof translates to main train station. That's been reconstructed also. And you're probably asking, what is the long pipe at about a 70 degree angle with what appears to be a man on it. Every, is it five or six years, Laura, we looked it up. About every five years, the city of Castle prides themselves by inviting artists from around the world to come for the summer and show off their artwork. Um, the long, this was done many years after I left. Um, I, I can't explain it, except I believe it's still there. That piece of art survived. I believe the artwork in that picture is probably 40 years older than the Steppenstrasse picture right above it. I think the Steppenstrasse picture was accomplished or finished in the mid to early 50s. I, you, the people walking there appeared to be all Germans to me, the way they are dressed. Um, Germans often walk on weekends for exercise. I think they still do that. The bottom picture on the right is a typical street in the city of Castle. Some of those buildings may have been reconstructed, but rather than the snazzy picture above it, that's, that's a typical picture that has been reconstructed. I think in the far distance is a church, I believe, it's a Protestant church, but I, I can't recall at this time what it actually um, denomination is. So when we went out on maneuvers, we traveled the countryside. I think I'm going to go to the lower right photo first. Those are the type of vehicles, our service. We didn't have tanks or armored our howitzers, but we traveled with trucks that had electronic equipment on the back. You can see the trucks have like little shanties or things on the back. Some of those had high-tech electronic spying equipment. Some of them had power units um, so they could run the equipment. Uh, so that, that was a pull-off that we maybe made after traveling two or three hours for a break, bathroom break. There was um, every hour to two hours on the Autobahn and major roads, there were American roadside restaurants where you could relieve your kidneys or buy an American piece of pie or a hamburger. Uh, we'll go back to the center top picture. This is a picture showing indicative of how rural areas of Western Germany were still using a beast of burden. Some had tractors, but the recovery was not complete. That shows a picture of a lady driving. I, I don't know if they were ox or if they were just milk cows, but you would often see 12 to 16 years after the war out in the field, still using beasts of burden, trying to recover to what they had before the war. The bottom picture, also taken about the same time, shows a German uh, double, double tandem truck. And that might have been my friend to the left in the picture. I would have to research my picture albums. That was, um, they did not have their tractors or engines mounted that much, but they had reconstructed many of the trailers. So many of the tractor engines were put on a vehicle that had lower gears and they hauled twice as much, which resulted in their speed being from maybe 30 to 45 miles an hour. They had long hills, six, 800 feet long, 
mile and a half long. By the time these double tandem trailers got to the top of those hills, the, the tractors were probably in as low gear as they could get and, and maybe down to eight to 12 miles an hour. So it was a slow recovery. Um, but the upper left-hand picture was taken along the countryside, not in Berlin, but along the countryside. That's where I and my sergeant got too close to the, what was then the Iron Curtain, which the sign indicates. There's a meter, plowed meter strip, barbed wire, a guard tower in the distance. That was indicative of hundred, hundreds of miles of border between East Germany um, and other countries. It took several years to build it. They were building out in a country before the Berlin Wall was constructed in East Berlin. I'm going to go to the bottom left. It shows an archway of a, a small city we were traveling through. Many of the small cities had patron saints, and I believe that would be the case of the statue up on top above the arch. Those archways and walls around cities were built in the 1800s in most cases and weren't very wide. I believe those to the left and the right, I think those are pedestrian doors. And the archway was for vehicles to come through small trucks. Maybe they were high because they had a load or they may have been hauling hay at that time. That particular time, I had time to take a picture because the vehicle in front of us, we were in a convoy like to the, to the right. One of our convoy vehicles in front of us hit head on with the German vehicle coming through the archway. Uh, they were three quarters of the way through, no signal lights. I would say it was the fault of our, the, I don't remember the guy's name, they hit the vehicle before it cleared. We were probably not aware that, I think that maybe there was a system as to who should go through. So as such, we had to wait for the MPs or the Germans to come and write up the accident or incident report. And as we were writing that up, I was sitting next to my friend, Pat, who was with me in a couple of the pictures. And that's why I've waited till now to talk about the picture in the upper right. Coming home from, I believe, school that day in the upper right-hand picture were three, I'm guessing, 10 to 12-year-old uh, German Fraulein's, German girls with slickers on. It was damp. Maybe that's what caused the Jeep to have an accident. They had slickers on. My friend Pat was driving and he had a lot of candy along because he was thinking of Halloween. Well, that's a different story, but he had a lot of candy along that he was going to spread out to us when we we're out in the boondocks. And he took his camera, grabbed this big bag of candy, his bags, jumped off. He was driving, ran around the truck, said nothing to me. And he gave each one of those girls a couple of handfuls and bags full of candy. So the candy didn't go to our maneuver site. It went to those three girls. As I've mentioned in my book, and as I've mentioned to other people viewing this, this picture, I and my friends were 19 to 21 years old. Those girls were approximately nine to 12 years younger. And it, the image sticks out to me very stark or vivid in my imagination. And I question myself, those young girls then are much older now, and they are probably in their early 70s. I'd pay $5 to find out if they could remember that. I'm thinking that it was such a difference to them an American soldier getting out of a big truck with a white star on, giving them candy, that they might remember that. I also question what did their parents say when they got home and told them about the candy in their hands from an American soldier? The answer to those two questions will never be known, but I'm, 
I'm guessing the candy got eaten. And I'm guessing those girls, at least one or two of them, might still remember the situation because it was so far removed from an ordinary day, ordinary life. Uh, a bigger difference to them than to me. The picture was taken by Pat Schmidt, who supplied many of the pictures. Um, he passed away about six or eight years ago and he gave, he and his children gave me many of his pictures, which I'm grateful for. The next picture shows peacetime maneuvers. We're out somewhere in the boondocks. It could be Grafenzer, High Brown, Fieldsec. I don't remember. Um, we were supposed to pretend it was war. Um, the man in the top left picture is, I believe he's drinking beer. It seems as if there's a bottle in front of his right foot. Um, that picture, those pictures are donated. There's our mess kits. He looks like he's maybe under the weather, not just the wet weather, maybe the alcoholic weather. To the lower left is another um, friend, Leonard Klusinski from Wisconsin, who put about three shelter halves together. And I think he's pretending he's guarding them. He's deceased about two years. Um, the lower right has the two of these people together. I think that now there are more bottles. And I think if we recall correctly, and you've been in Germany, or if you've been to Europe, you realize their beer is a little more toxic, higher alcohol content than ours. Those had the flip top bottles with a gasket on top that you could drink half, seal it shut, and it had a snap that it would be quite tight. Um, Franks doesn't appear as if he's moved much from the upper left picture to the lower right picture. Um, and Pluto, the bigger guy with the glasses, he's the one on the left picture. Those pictures are probably from his collection. The upper right, um, I'm not going to go into too much. Believe it or not, that is our commanding sergeant. He's a little obese. We had nicknames for him that we used when he couldn't hear it. Um, modern day army, they would not allow a person to be that overweight and out of um, condition. So our most reverent name for him after two others was Portly. So I'll let that sink in. Portly, I believe it's actually the description of a clothing garment for an obese man, isn't it? I'm asking. I think portly is a, a term used in the garment industry for people that are built about like that. Um, yours truly speaking right now, I can identify with portly. I, I didn't get to that point, but obviously we many of us gain weight as we get older. So those are typical scenes of a maneuver when we were not inside our units working we were um, maybe getting ready to work or we had 12 hours off. Then another picture on maneuvers, the top upper left. I am the one that's aiming the rifle a little too high, but we never did point a rifle at a person. The left is my roommate, John Frame. Here's truly Jerry. The third guy, kind of hard, Richard Langley. I will say he's a Cajun from Louisiana, very proud of that. And on the right, Eugene Thomas, uh, now living in Michigan, I believe is still alive. Those were indicative of the clothing in the late 50s, early 60s, when you were out working. Um, name tag above the right-hand pocket, US Army above the left-hand pocket. Rank on our sleeve, Richard, the tall one in the middle, above, up on his left-hand shoulder, hard to make out. It was our uh, unit that we were under two or three levels called Fifth Corps. It's uh, got spokes, like five spokes in it. Lower left, we we're posing with a tank that we had no business being on, but we wanted to feel as if we actually got close to a tank. Uh, again, there's Pluto to the left, Jerry Reynolds to the left, Franks to the right. Um, 
I think Ellis put the sunglasses on and Oral's sitting there. So kind of like the car several shades back. Many of you watching this maybe were served your time in a tank. Uh, typical building, small towns would have buildings several stories high, generally narrow roads going around next to a river. So we would do our war games. And since those games were maneuvers, when we're working, we're classified. So I don't think I have any pictures which were forbidden to be taken at the time. Uh, more off duty back at our base. We weren't serious. Uh, we're having a good time. First picture left me truly, here's truly, Eugene Thomas, Patchmitt, John Frame, Stockton, I forget the man's name, top, Billy Stockton uh, from Mississippi, Pat Schmidt and Wayne Gay, lower left in front of our building. Looks like we were not too serious as it says. Again, lower right, typical room, uh, wall lock was behind us. You can see a little bit of the bed to the right. Uh, we were having a good time once we realized that the border was usually quiet. We were 15 kilometers from the border. If a Russian MiG jet shot a ballistic missile or similar to a sidewinder at our barracks, we probably wouldn't have got out the front door. Maybe it would have taken 45 to 60 seconds to arrive at our front step, but we had to leave off some steam. So with that being said, if we have people out there, I, I want to salute all of you who've been patient and you people that have been in different branches, different eras, 20, 30 years later, you're all saluted for your service. You're saluted the day before Veterans Day. And if you've hung on and listened to my boring, what might be to you boring, I'd be glad to listen to you and pick up on your comments. Well, Jerry, on Facebook, uh, Lori made the comment when you were talking about Portly, very true. My husband wouldn't be in the shape he is today if he wasn't still in the army. <laughs> I, I can understand. I understand. They wouldn't, wouldn't let it go. Jerry? Right. Yes. Jerry, this is Al Gabor. I was an 05... Uh, nine oh five eight i'm sorry in rothwestern from 66 to 68 wow it was my interesting. God, you're on, Alan. <laughs> and you... uh, was interesting to see the pictures i didn't realize the mark was and was the, the invented there i didn't know that i learned a lot, I learned a lot. well i didn't realize it till many years later either um so you, what building were you in alan I was on Dog Trick, D Trick, which was the last building down on the row of buildings. Uh, and that, when I was there, the we, we the um, the op center was out there in the middle of the antenna field. We had the the op center was out there, and I was uh, the barracks was the last one down. The building that you showed was the EM Club uh, when I was there. The the building that was your barracks. Yes. If you faced it where you were looking to the left, was the they they turned that into the EM Club when I was there. Okay, I, I'm a little confused. I was in a building that was a double building on the end of a street? Yeah. Okay, it, it, they made one of those, the AM club? Yes, if you faced we, you had the picture you had on the left-hand side, that That's, area that was, became the EM club when I was there. Okay, and your operations building was out on the antenna field? Yes. Yeah. We uh, we used to walk, walk across the, the old airfield to get to it. And we were there. I was there during the um, invasion of Czechoslovakia. So we copied the Russians for weeks before they invaded Czechoslovakia. Uh, and a few of my friends actually get killed there. They went down to, or they were on that boat, the Liberty. They asked a bunch of us to volunteer to go on the ship, the Liberty in, in the Mediterranean. And they, they all got killed when it was missile bombed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, again, your years were 60 what? December 66 to December 68. So. All right, that was like eight years after I was there. The operations building that that you worked in, it was uh, close to what was then the officers club, but I think it was too small. I think that was the, you know, you had 
uh, we were 184th, 182nd headquarters. Couple, it was just busting at the seams from so many people. And as the uh, forces in Eastern Germany were growing in number, they needed more room and maybe more for efficiency. Did you have at that time, you said that was in this men club, did you also have a snack bar area? Um, we did, we had a, actually, if you went up towards the operations center on the left, we did have a PX there. And then across the street beside the PX, while I was there, they built the commissary. My wife was actually the first customer to go in the commissary because we used to have to go down to Castle to buy our food before the commissary was built. Very interesting. And the way the way the military changes things back and forth. Um, <laughs> did, did you have a chapel upstairs in a building? Um, no, we did have a chapel, but it was, yes, it was upstairs in the entry when you went into the, and as you entered, it was yes. on the left-hand side. There was, a, there was a movie theater there and the chapel was there as well. Well, they sure changed a lot. So that was in the large building to the left as you went in. Correct. Correct. Yeah. After the guardhouse. After the guardhouse, yeah. Okay. When when I was there, you went past the, the theater building about two blocks and there was a large building. Upstairs was a chapel and downstairs was a snack bar and they had a commissary at that time. The, there was an archway between the snack bar and the commissary. And the commissary carried a lot of things, uh, canned goods and uh, cheeses and things that guys bought and took back to the room and ate. So the commissary came and went. There was a big motor pool over on the far side of Castle near the Autobahn. Yep. And I forget what it's called, but some of those people came over to our commissary and our snack bar because it was very sparse over on the other side. I lived now, over there. I lived in Sandershausen, which was over by the Audubon. The, the Audubon service area was there. Right. I, lived, I lived in Sandershausen. Which what was, name was it? Sandershausen. Sandershausen. Uh, they, they some, yeah, you have to go by the Hercules Brewery to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that took a while. <laughs> okay, it's, it's remarkable. It? Thank, thank you so much for thank oh. say, thank you so much for, for for doing this. It brought back a lot of good memories, and we, we had a good time over there. Met a lot of good friends. Uh, that is correct, uh, Alan. Do you belong to any of the face group people that are online from Rothweston? Yes, I do. I, I'm on the Voth, I am on the Facebook group from Rothweston. Yes, I okay. am. Uh -huh. There are there are two face groups from Rothwestern. Um, I belong to both of them, and they each have, I think, around 250 to 260 members. Not a whole lot. Do you have you run across Vern Granke's locator? Does it yes, bring a bell? Yes, I did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I I, uh, I used to live up in, uh, in southern New Hampshire. I used to go to uh, luncheons at, over by Fort Devens uh, before I, I moved to Florida, uh, and uh, we used to we used to have a good group. They're still getting together up there, the whole group. So we're we're all dying off, but we're still some of us left. <laughs> yeah, we, we are all dying off, but um, I I'm finding that my friend who's deceased last November from COVID, his daughter was in the Air Force, made a career of it. She said, um, she called us slackers. <laughs> <laughs> She's a colonel. And, and uh, my buddy, her father said, if it wasn't for our slackers protecting the country, you would have never had a career. <laughs> well, it was interesting because when I was, then it was during Vietnam and, and some of us were, were sent out to different places, TDY. And before I went overseas at Fort Devons, they had a thing called tactical training course. And it was a 10 day okay. course and we all had to go out and live in, in the woods and we would get <laughs> tackled and tortured. I remember one time they put me in a ball locker full of snakes and beat on them and stuff to because really? we were to train us not to talk. Because, well, we all had our clearances and they wanted to make sure we wouldn't talk about what we were doing. It was interesting. They, they put you in the locker with live snakes? Yeah. Yeah, and then they would turn. I would have talked. and then they would turn us up. They would put uh, wires in our boots and crank electricity 
through the through our boots and stuff. It was in, interesting. So we weren't slackers. That's all I'm saying. Oh, that sounds <laughs> more like Marine Special Forces. Um, if there isn't another, I have a few more questions. You're 058. Yes. Did you do your training at Devons or Fort Gordon? Fort Devons. Fort Devons. Fort Devons. Okay. Yeah. We 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 got sent to Gordon yeah. for 23 weeks. Was that your period of time too? 20 some weeks? It's about 26, I think it was 26 weeks, okay. yes. And then I came back to Devons my last six months and I was an instructor there for my last All six right. months. All right. Good. All right. We we thank you. We had 23 weeks, then we got set to Devons for eight or nine more weeks to learn the uh, electronic jamming, the, the equipment that, that we yeah. had. So when we first got to Rothwestern, we went, our equipment wasn't there. So we worked at the operations building with the old five eights. And after eight or nine weeks, our huts and electronic stuff came in. We spent about a third of our time out in the field. Yeah, it's a, uh, people. People don't. They look at me. And say, "What did you do?" I said, "I was a Morse intercept operator." And people say, "What is that today?" <laughs> well, thank thank you so much, Jerry, for your your presentation. I really appreciated it. Well, thank, you, thank you're you. welcome. I'm glad you tuned in. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Might see your name on one of those Ralph Weston groups because if you, I believe, if you click on members, it gives you all the names of everyone in the group. So good, good, good. look for you, Alan. Well, thank, thank you for your you. service, sir. Thank you both. This was very interesting. Um, and thank you for your service. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>